So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, could I have the first slide up, please? I feel like Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so can anyone tell me, and young people, you probably have no clue, can anyone tell me, well, first of all, actually, young people, can any young people guess what era this particular group of then young people are from? Can you guess what era they might be from? What decade? What decade? Hands up, anybody? Nine, 90s? Yeah, 90s, 2000s. So can anyone tell me who they are? <laughs> S Club 7. There is seven of them there. There is seven of them there. S Club 7. I can't remember what the S stood for. Anyone remember what the S stood for? Did it stand for anything? It was just a, or just a letter. You're going to Google it while we're doing it. Okay, so yeah. So yeah, they are S Club 7. And I'm going to start my sermon with some lyrics from one of their songs. It's very profound. <laughs> There's a place waiting just for you. It's a special place where your dreams all come true. Fly away, swim the ocean blue, drive that open road, leave the past behind you. Don't stop, got to keep moving, your hopes got to keep building. Never, ever forget that I've got you and you've got me. So reach for the stars, climb every mountain higher. Reach for the stars, follow your heart's desire. Reach for the stars, and when that rainbow's shining over you, then your dreams will all, will all come true. Don't believe in all that you've been told. The sky's the limit, you can reach your goal. No one knows just what the future holds, there ain't nothing you can be, the whole world's at your feet. And we did say that, not sing it, because otherwise YouTube will take our video down. <laughs> yeah. So why did I read that? It's not scripture, obviously. So for me, those words kind of sum up the spirit of the age that I grew up in. That's from a song uh, called Reach, which was sung by S Club 7 in the year 2000, the year I turned 18. And now you can all work out how old I am. And I am feeling old. I'm, finding, I'm, finding, I'm saying this a lot more. When I was young, I hate saying, and then I immediately think, oh no, that means I'm not young anymore. <laughs> but yeah, so that was kind of sums up when I was growing up, the kind of spirit of the age. We were all told that there was a unique contribution that only we could make to the world. That we had a destiny, and all our dreams could come true if we just believed it hard enough. You have to be a dreamer, work for your goal. And then we also saw, I don't know if you remember, those of you who were around there, these kind of motion, motivational posters popping up everywhere. Do you remember these? The kind of, you know, kind of pretty pictures with a nice slogan underneath. You know, similar slogans are there, you know. Passion creates energy. Strike out with joy and exhilaration and others are sure to join you. Take the initiative and lead the way. You can make the difference. Some excel because they are destined to. Most excel because they are determined to. They all sound great, don't they? Sound great. But they don't actually mean very much. And in fact, when you consider them carefully, you'll probably find that they aren't true. I mean, strike out with joy and exhilaration and others are sure to join you. But it depends where you're going, frankly. Just because you're full of joy and exhilaration doesn't mean everyone else is. And I think sometimes for me, so I grew up in the church, I was... Uh, my parents are Christians, uh, wonderful Christian people, and they raised me in the church. And I think, and I think I, as being a young person in the church, I found that some of, it, some of this thinking was reflected in my youth group. There was a lot of talk about what is your gift? What does God want for you to do with your life? What is God's mission for you? But the thing is, God doesn't want us to focus in. He wants us to focus out that the enemy is always trying to drive our focus inwards to ourselves, inwards and downwards, inwards to ourselves and downwards to our circumstances. But God is always trying to drive our focus up, upwards towards him, to focus on him and out to others. Actually, I think we'll find the Bible is quite clear what our purpose is, and it's the same purpose that every living creature on earth has. Are you ready? You're about to hear your purpose your life's work and your reason for being. And it's the only thing that we do that will continue into eternity. Our purpose is to worship the living God. And from the very beginning of time, worship is central to our relationship with God. And it's how humans relate to him. Next slide, please. <laughs> so I've got them written up here. I'm just going to go through them very quickly. There's some, there's some scriptures there. 
So uh, Adam and Eve worshipped God. They walked with him in the cool of the evening. Abraham, when, he's called, when God calls him and gives him a new name, does anyone know what his new name was? What was God's new Abraham. Thank you, Emma. When God calls him and gives him a new name, he falls down on his face in worship. Mo- Moses takes off his sandals before God. And then when God brings his people out of Egypt and establishes them as a nation, Miriam leads the people in song and dance. David, sometimes called the greatest king of Israel, he worships God on the harp. Before he's ever a king, he's a worshipper. And then he writes so many of the Psalms. And there it is, right in the middle of the Bible, the longest book in the Bible, and it's full of praise and worship to God. And then in the New Testament, Jesus tells the woman at the well that, he's, that God is looking for true worshippers. And when, he's, uh, when um, he's coming into Jerusalem, people cry out in praise and worship. And when the Pharisees try to stop them, Jesus says, don't stop them. If you stop them, the stones will cry out. But how terrible would that be? If we stop worshipping God, the stones would have to cry out. But it's our privilege to worship God. Now, this is so different from the personal destiny, the personal mission that I was promised as a young person, because it's not about me reaching my goals, and it's not even about me fulfilling my dreams. You see, when we worship God, it moves our focus away from ourselves, it moves our focus away from inside to up, to God himself. And it's not about me, it's about him, and it's all about him. People need purpose in life. They need a reason for being. They need a raison d'etre. I like a bit of French. It just means reason for life, really. They need a reason for life. And when they have that purpose, it can give them confidence. It can spur them on to do new things. But we don't need that from anywhere else because we have that in the worship of God. We have that in God. He is my confidence. He is my ability. He is everything I need to be fulfilled and satisfied. My dreams are so small and so temporary when I compare them to the wonder of knowing Jesus and being known by him. When you give your life to worship, you find a purpose that is more satisfying than any purpose you could dream up for yourself. Now you might be like, but but everybody worships. Everybody worships. What, what, What is my contribution to that? But actually, worship is designed to be done together. It is something we do together as a church community, and not just our church community, but across the globe, across the whole people of God. We join with each other in worship. And that makes our worship even greater. Just like a body is more than a collection of chemicals, and a building is more than a collection of bricks, when we worship together, it's more and greater than our individual contributions. And God sees your worship. God sees your worship. When you're standing and worshipping God with so many other people, it was uh, over 100 people here, probably, I can't count quickly, <laughs> or over or thousands of people at a Soul Survivor meeting, God still sees your individual worship. And it is just as valuable to him. It is no, it's no less valuable because you share it with your congregation and with all living things. I think humans weren't really designed for the pressure of our own destiny. And you see this. You see this in young people giving up and not wanting to do anything because it's just too much. And what if we miss it? What if we do something wrong? What if we're unlucky? What if we make a bad choice? Does that mean that we've missed our purpose in life? And we're doomed to just wander through life. So many of my peers who were told that they had this amazing thing that only they could do. You know, they, so uh, in my day, everyone wanted to be a singer or an actor or a footballer. Often now it's like YouTubers and things like that. But everybody wanted to be famous. Everybody wanted everyone to know their name. But for the vast majority of us, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> but your name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It doesn't matter how many people know your name. All that really matters is, does God know your name? 
And that frees us from all that pressure. The thing is, God is always there. He's always steadfast. He's always worthy of our worship. And he will always accept your worship. No matter how many mistakes you've made, no matter how you're feeling, no matter what is going on in your life, God will always accept your worship. When you're, our purpose is not our responsibility. And that lifts a weight from us because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So if our purpose is to worship God, we're going to spend some time thinking about what this might actually look like. So we're going to look at uh, when Jesus, we're going to look in a bit more detail at when Jesus spoke with a Samaritan woman that uh, that he met at a well. Now, this story is an amazing story, and I encourage you to go and read it yourself many times. And you could actually preach about ten sermons just from this one encounter, but I'll just stick to one (laughs) today. (laughs) So... um, Yeah, and uh, to give you some background, so uh, Samaritans, uh, they believed in God, they believed in Yahweh, the living God, but in Jesus' time, they were excluded from worship because they weren't allowed uh, into the temple in Jerusalem. So uh, we're going to see what Jesus said to the woman. Can we bring up the reading? I don't know, would anyone like to read this? No? Come on. (laughs) <laughs> oh, it's all right. I, I'll take them. I'll take the mic over to him. We'll do a roving mic. Yeah? Can you see it? You need to come where you can see it. Can you see it? You want to come where you can see it, Daniel? Right. On the stage. Why not? <laughs> It's more than one page. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Sir, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You want to read this bit as well? Do I carry on? Do I carry on? Woman just replied, Believe me, a time coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and the, in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and He worship, and His worshippers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. Very good. Well done. Excellent reading there. So uh, the woman, she wanted to know about where she should worship. Sorry. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> where she should worship. And uh, she might even have been trying to use this question to distract Jesus because he'd been challenging her in the previous verses. And it, you know, sometimes when we're talking to people that don't know God, uh, they will try and distract us with uh, various old chestnuts that they know some, uh, if they get us started, we'll never stop, and we'll stop talking about Jesus. But Jesus, doesn't be, is, Jesus isn't distracted. He gets to the heart of the issue. He's more concerned about what her worship looks like rather than where it happens. So true worship is in the spirit and in truth. That's what Jesus says. It's in the spirit and in the truth. Now, it's in the Spirit because when we come to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. And it's him that enables us to express this true worship to God. And this is true of every believer. Every uh, every Christian has the Spirit of God living inside of them. That's what it says says in the Bible, that his Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And it's truth because we know who we worship. Our worship is informed by by, uh, the truth of who God is. So this isn't, I don't think this is meant to be like a tick list. Like when you come to worship, you tick it off. Am I worshipping in spirit? 
Yes. Am I worshipping in truth? Yes. No, <laughs> I don't say that it's a, you don't need to tick it off. And you don't really need to worry about it either. You don't need to think, oh, I don't know. Is my worship in the spirit? Is my worship in truth? If you know God, then his spirit lives inside you. And if you, if you read your Bible and you accept teaching, then you know the truth of who he is, in part. Nobody can know everything of who God is. But you don't, so you don't need to worry, am I worshipping in the spirit and in truth? Because if you're a Christian and you know God, you are. That is your worship. And your worship is always acceptable to God. So I thought uh, well, we'd have a bit of Greek on a Sunday morning. Who doesn't like a bit of ancient Greek on a Sunday morning? Do you want, could you bring up the next slide, please, Paul? <laughs> so, um, would anyone like to, you know, have a go at pronouncing, uh, pronouncing this word? The, uh, the pronunciation is in brackets afterwards. Look at that. You don't have to be a young person. <laughs> go on then, Emma. Run. Is it? See if you can... See, so there you go. If you, just a word at the top there. Can you read that? <laughs> no, no. So it's spelt out underneath. Can you read that? In brackets. Pros Cunio. It's very good. This is a good. Very good. And do you want to just read the definition as well? What does it mean? To fall down or to prostrate oneself to do one's knees. Do you know what prostrate means? It means, it means the first bit, it means to fall down. So when you prostrate, it's what Abraham did before uh, when he was made, in, well, when he was made into Abraham. He fell down flat on his face. He uh, prostrate, prostrated himself before uh, Jesus. And this is the attitude of a true worshipper. A true worshipper makes themselves lower and lesser than the one they worship. There, is, there has to be humility in worship, otherwise it's not worship. If you think that you're an excellent worshipper, you're not an excellent worshipper. <laughs> because it's not about you, it's about his excellence, not yours. And a true worshipper uses their whole self and leaves nothing behind. Their whole body is engaged in worshipping God. And it's, uh, so is singing part of worship? Absolutely. And you can, there are so many examples in scripture of sung worship. And there are so many benefits to sung worship. In fact, there are, you know, they, we have choirs popping up everywhere now, don't we? Because apparently there are benefits to singing communally. Well, I would say there probably is. But if you're not worshipping the living God in, in song, you're missing out on a whole, whole load of other benefits. But when we sing, we use our bodies as an instrument. We're doing it together as a community. We have to sing together at the same time, in the same place. We have to sing the same song. And so it draws us together. We remember spiritual truths. As a child growing up, I learned far more from the songs that I sang than from the sermons that I heard. And they're songs, that, and they are, you know, and they are scriptures. There are scriptures that I remember far better because I've sang them. And we encourage one another as well. When we see each other singing, we encourage one another. And there are many other ways we can worship communally. Actually, we can. You can worship in dance. You can worship in art, in writing, in prayer, in poetry, in scripture reading. And we tried to, I tried to include a little bit of those in our worship today. We had the light zone. We had the young people uh, bringing a scripture because that's worship as well. And, uh, if you, and there were some coloring sheets available. Drawing and art can be worship as well. But the most important thing when we worship is where is our focus? Is it on him? Because if it's not, if your focus is on singing a beautiful song, then it's not worship. And we have to give ourselves fully to it. Now, some people don't want to sing. They don't want to sing because they're too self-conscious. They think people are looking at them. Or they think, oh, I can't sing. My voice, my voice is awful. But you really need to put that aside because your worship is not about you. It's about the one you worship. It doesn't matter. And you cannot be too enthusiastic in worship. You cannot give too much. So if you want to dance, then dance. And if you want to write, then write. And if you want to draw, then draw. But do it wholeheartedly and with only one consideration. Jesus. Only one focus. Just give yourself to worship. 
But I would say that true worship goes even further than this. And uh, Paul writes about worship, about worship in his letter uh, to the church in Rome. Who would like to read this scripture? Who would like to read this scripture? Yeah. Do you want to come up, Amelia, or I can come to you? Do you want me to come to you? you can you see it? <laughs> Therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God this is your true and proper worship Absolutely well done I was going to use that one. That was confusing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Paul actually uses a different word for worship here than the one we heard before. It's not proscunio. I, I don't... It's a... Uh, it's... Yeah, so who would like to have a go at pronouncing this one? I have, but I want to know... I want someone else to have a go at pronouncing it. No! You're all so scared. Oh, there we go. Sienna, come on then. I would think you're not used to participating in sermons. <laughs> so how do we say that? So it's in the brackets. I know. Okay. It's either... <laughs> <laughs> Latria. Latria or Latria? No, yeah? Well, yeah. yeah. And, and what does it mean? Service rendered to God. Service rendered to God. Absolutely. Well done. <laughs> And actually, although obviously in scripture it's, it's uh, translated as services rendered to God, it does actually mean service, service to anybody, service to any deity. But obviously we are rendering our services to the one true God. So Paul here is encouraging the Romans, and he says, in view of, of therefore, wherever you see the word therefore in scripture, you should always read before, because it means there's something that comes before that this relates to, but I'm not going to do that, but you should do that. You should read Romans 11, <laughs> and 10, and 8, and 9, <laughs> because basically Paul had just spent the last few chapters outlining the amazing work that Christ has done for us, that he has rescued us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into his glorious kingdom of light, and that when we were stuck in sin, he came and he rescued us. And even though we were far away from him and enemies to him, he came and rescued us. So in view of this, he is encouraging us to give ourselves, our whole lives, as a living sacrifice in service to God. In view of this, in all that God has done for us, there is only one response, to give our lives in worship. So I was thinking about sacrifice and uh, what, uh, what a sacrifice should look like. Um, and actually, uh, I'm, I'm going to read this one. <laughs> There's a, a verse right at the, near the beginning of the Bible, the story of Cain and Abel, that you might know. Some of you might know that story. It doesn't end well for either of them, really. Can we bring that one up? So now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with, with favour. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. I like that description, downcast face. Angry face. <laughs> Downcast face. Angry face. Now, I, when you first read the story, you might feel a bit sorry for Cain. Like, well, what's the problem? He brought an offering. He brought an offering to God. They both brought offerings. But Cain just gave some of his harvest. He had a big harvest, and he went, there you go. God can have that cabbage and that carrot and that potato. And he just brought them. And it didn't really cost him anything. It was just some of his harvest. But Abel, he brought the first and the best, fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. He probably wanted to use them to, to breed, to make new sheep, to grow a strong and healthy flock. But he knew that the, his first and his best belonged to God. 
And that's a feature of any sacrifice we bring to God. It must be our first and our best. And you can see that continued throughout the Old Testament, both in practice and in the law, that we are commanded to bring something without... The the Jews were commanded to bring something without spot or blemish, the firstborn, their first and their best. So we are living sacrifices, which is always handy. It's nicer to be a living sacrifice than a dead one. (laughs) But if we are to be living sacrifices, we have to give God our first and not what's left over when we've done all the things that we want to do. Worship isn't something you can crowbar into your life. Oh, I'll spend Monday to, I'll spend Monday to Friday pursuing what my purpose is in life. Saturday I'll have a rest and Sunday I'll come and worship God. That's not the way it works. The, God, the worship of God comes first because he deserves the first of our energy, our time and our love. And it must be our best as well. Not what we think we can afford, but what we know he deserves. We can't say, oh, I, well, I need this. I need this for myself. I can't give this to God. I, I can't give this to God today because I need it for myself. No, you give it to God. And actually, God in his faithfulness so often gives it straight back to us, more and greater. And I'm not necessarily talking about money though it could be money, but I'm talking about your time, your energy, your affection. You know, my, my, uh, my mum didn't have the earliest, uh, the easiest uh, start to married life, because when she married my dad, he already had uh, three uh, young, he already had three children approaching, two of them were teenagers already, and the other one was about to be a teenager. And uh, she didn't know what she, she didn't know how to love them all. And, uh, and so, she, uh, so she focused on my dad. She thought, if I, if I love my husband, then that's all I can do. But actually, if she gave her first love, and she said this, <laughs> I don't know, she said this to me, that actually if she'd focused on God and given her first love to God, then everything else may have fallen in place, and it would have been a lot easier for us. So worship, we need to give all of ourselves in worship. And we can worship through service as well. It doesn't have, it isn't, it is singing, it is coming together, it is communal, and it's also through when we serve the Lord. Now, you might think I'm coming back to the beginning, you know, what is my purpose? What does God want me to do? And I think sometimes we can be so busy trying to work out what God wants us to do, we miss what God wants us to do. <laughs> because the, the, the letters to the early church are full of descriptions about what God wants us to do, how he wants us to serve. I have a news. We're to be an ambassador for Christ. We're to work at, whatever we work at, we're to work at it with our whole heart as working for the Lord. We're to bear with each other, forgive each other. We're to be thankful in all circumstances. We're to show hospitality to strangers. We're to be content with what we have. We're to do good and to share with others. We should have confidence in our leaders and we should submit to their authority. We should make every effort to live in peace with each other. We should encourage the disheartened, help the weak, and be patient with everybody. (laughs) And bear one another's burdens. So those are all taken from Thessalonians, from Hebrews, from Romans, and there are others in the other letters as well. And they're instructions to the early church, to the early Christians, and they're also instructions to us. So when we do all of this, when we give our lives in service, we're actually giving our lives in worship, and we're fulfilling our God-given purpose. You don't need a voice from heaven telling you to serve God. You've already been told it, you just need to do it. (laughs) We need to take every opportunity presented to us to serve God and to be obedient to him. So a life given in worship of the living God is a life full of meaning and full of purpose. And every one of us can fulfill this purpose. Every one of us can worship wholeheartedly without a thought to ourselves. And every one of us can serve with our first and our best. You don't need to find your destiny. And you don't need to reach for the moon. You just need to bow at his feet in adoration of the God who gave everything for us. I'm going to... I shall pray. (laughs) 
Dear Lord, thank you for your great mercy to us. Thank you for all that you have done for us. And we worship you for what you have done and for who you are. I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes focused on you. I pray you would help us to forget ourselves and focus on you, forget our self-consciousness and know that you are worthy to be worshipped. And I pray in doing that we would find all the fulfilment, all the purpose and all the strength that we need. Amen.